My name is Ken Armstrong. I'm the president and CEO of North Arrow Minerals, and the purpose of this presentation is to provide a, an update on the PQ Diamond Project and our activities over the last year, and also to provide some context for some micro diamond results that we reported on September 8th for the PK150 Kimberlite. As is typical in a presentation like this, I will be making some forward-looking statements as we look at uh, what we've done and what we're going to do, so it's important to keep that in mind and to be familiar with the language in this forward-looking statement. I'll start just by providing a bit of background on the project and how we got to uh, where we are right now. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the drilling program that we completed earlier this year in 2015 and the kimberlites we discovered and, uh, and then also of course the diamond results from PK150 and, and what we'll have in the next little while for results and exploration activity going forward. PICU is an 80-20 joint venture with our partner Stornoway Diamond Corporation. We each uh, fund our proportionate share of the exploration of the project. The location of the project is important to keep in mind. It's, it's very well located with respect to, to power and transportation infrastructure. The southern part of the claims are only about 10 kilometers from Saskatchewan Highway 911 and, and the community of Deschambault Lake. Um, the claims are about halfway between Larange and Flin Flon, and in an area that uh, prior to the discovery of, of kimberlites by, uh, by the joint venture in 2013, was not known to, to have, uh, have any kimberlites at all. We're about 200 kilometers from the Fort Isla cornfield, just to give you uh, an idea of, of where we sit with respect to that, with that project. So we completed the first drilling on the project in 2013 and discovered a number of kimberlites at that time. Uh, the most important discovery was PK-150, and, uh, and the diamond results from PK-150 were really exceptional for an initial discovery. We submitted 210 kilogram sample for microdiamond analysis, and that sample returned 745 diamonds, including 23 diamonds greater than 0.85 millimeters. And it was on the basis of those results then that we uh, returned in 2014, conducted a very intensive till sampling program, and then followed that up with further drilling earlier this year which resulted in the discovery of another four kimberlites and, uh, and significantly expanded the size of PK-150. The PQ project has really been built around the concept of till sampling and indicator mineral analysis. Uh, it, it works. It works in this region, and, and we've talked a, a fair bit about that over, over the last couple of years. In total, almost a 1,000 samples have been collected from the property. Um, we process those samples and, and look for indicator minerals, uh, or kimberlite indicator minerals, or minerals that are derived from, from kimberlite intrusions. And when we talk about a positive sample. The positive sample is anything in this area, anything that has even a single grain in it is considered positive. But when we get really close to a source, it seems we're into samples that uh, contain hundreds of indicator minerals. And that's an indication to us that we're, we're certainly getting closer to, to a source. Um, we've identified a number of indicator mineral trains within the property. And also, uh, it's important to keep in mind when we talk about that, that all of these trains represent probe confirmed indicator mineral counts. This map gives an idea of where the indicator minerals, the positive samples are on the property. As you'll see in the other slides, it kind of ties in and makes sense with where we've done our drilling and where we've been looking to find these, these kimberlites. So PK-150, as I mentioned, it was our discovery in 2013, and it was a focus of the drilling when we went back earlier this spring in 2015. Overall, the 2015 drill program consisted of 24 holes, a little over 3,200 meters of drilling, and we, we did test for new kimberlites, and made a, a four new kimberlite discoveries, and we also focused on redrilling PK-150 and trying to expand it, and uh, we were successful in that. PK-150 was drilled by another six holes. Uh, five of those holes hit kimberlite, brings the total number of drill holes in the body to nine, and we extended the strike length of the body to 150 meters and drilled it to almost 200 meters of depth. It is cut off to the west, as we'll see on the next slide, but it remains wide open on the eastern end of the body and open for further expansion. This slide um, gives us an idea of the drilling pattern at PK-150. What we're looking at is an image of the ground geophysical survey grid that was completed. The survey lines that you can see, those black squiggly lines are nominally 25 meters apart. The dark red circles represent the drill collars from 2015, and then the lighter collars are those from 2013. And so um, you can see from this image, the westernmost hole did not hit kimberlite, or any, you don't see any green in it. Um, so that's the hole that we used uh, as a basis to say that it has been cut off to the west. But on the eastern side, it remains wide open. And that easternmost drill hole is drill hole 34. 
And we actually drilled it just to try and cut the body off to the east. We cut it off to the west, and we just thought, well, we were right at the end of the program, and, and 34 was the last hole of the program. We thought, let's just cut PK-150 off to the east and be done with it. And, in fact, the, the, the opposite happened, and um, we hit uh, one of our widest intercepts yet in the Kimberlite. In plan view, it's well over 20 meters wide in this area. And what was really interesting and is really interesting is the Kimberlite itself is, is quite weakly magnetic. It's not strongly magnetic like the, the coherent hypobyssal Kimberlite that we're seeing at the west end of the body. And texturally, we see evidence uh, for the Kimberlite to be more of a transitional to diatreme or Kimberly type of volcanic plastic kimberlite and that is important for a number of reasons it's a weaker magnetic signature is important for uh, opening the door to more subtle magnetic anomalies being being targets of interest within the project it also with the texturally and, and, and seeing transitional kimberlite opens the door for the greater volume potential in some of these bodies so it is quite an important drill hole and most importantly it means the body's wide wide open in that direction we uh, submitted for diamond analysis, 323 kilos of kimberlite to be uh, analyzed by caustic fusion. Um, just showing you the holes from which those samples came from. We submitted samples from PK-34 as well as drill holes 16 and 18. And, and we'll come back to that in a couple of slides when we're showing the results. So you can just keep in mind where those drill holes are located. Um, the results from September 8th that, uh, that we announced, the 323 kilogram sample on the recovery of 487 diamonds larger than 0.106 millimeters, and that included nine diamonds greater than 0.85 millimeters. And similar to the 2013 results, uh, a large portion of the diamonds are clear white diamonds, over three quarters of them are white diamonds. And importantly, that transitional kimberlite from hole 34 return results that are consistent with the remainder of the body. So that's really important when we start thinking about, well, if the body's going to extend to the east and there's some size potential there, it appears that the diamond potential of that body is consistent with uh, the remainder of what we've hit so far. Obviously, with microdiamond data, they're tough to, uh, to figure out as a table full of numbers. The best way to try and, and picture what's going on are through some images. This is a, uh, a diagram of the size frequency data for the 2013 PK-150 microdiamond results and the 2015 results that we just announced. And it's a, on the y-axis, we're plotting stones for 100 tons per unit interval, and on the x-axis, we're looking at the stone size. And the takeaway from this is the 2013 data, or the red line, and the 2015 data, the black line, and they're, they're pretty close. We're still talking about pretty small samples. In our view, they support each other. The 2015 data are slightly below the, the 2013 data, which equates to fewer, fewer diamonds, but overall, these results are pretty consistent with each other. This next slide is showing just the 2015 data as a whole in the blue line, and then also on a hole-by-hole -hole basis, so holes 16, 18, and 34. And the takeaway here that we're trying to get across is uh, this consistency of the diamond content as we go from hole to hole, and most important, the fact that hole 34, so that easternmost hole, does contain uh, similar diamond counts and, and counts that are consistent with the rest of the body, which, as I mentioned earlier, is important when considering the prospectivity of the body as we will look to, to expand it with further drilling. Another slide that we've used before just for comparison purposes was showing the PK-150 microdiamond data as compared to CH6 kimberlite at the Chidliac project at Peregrines and also the Kelvin kimberlite of Kennedy's in the Northwest Territories. And, and the main reason for making that comparison is both of those remain really the highest profile diamond exploration projects in Canada. And the PK-150 sample curve still compares very well to both of those projects. It, it overlaps uh, with portions of those trains with the larger sample size we have now, the PK-150 curve is flattening out a little bit. There still is a kink as we get to the coarser diamond sizes, and, and obviously we need a bigger sample to continue to try and smooth that out. But it, it supports our interpretation that PK-150 is a significantly diamond-bearing body, and clearly we need to get a bigger sample with more drilling and try and get a, a complete picture on how big this kimberlite is. And that'll be part, as, as we talk about towards the end of the presentation, our way forward, and part of what we're going to want to do in our next phase is is obviously more drilling. Looking at the remainder of, of the project area and the other kimberlite discoveries that were made, I'll just briefly touch on some of them. PK311 is a kimberlite, and on September 8th in the news release, we announced that we confirmed that it was a kimberlite. It is a weathered micaceous unit that we had intersected at the head of the easternmost indicator train on the property, and we weren't totally sure if it was a kimberlite or not. Um, we submitted about a kilo and a half of that material for indicator mineral analysis and, uh, and the result is that it is it's definitely kimberlitic it's a kimberlite 
hundreds of, uh, of pyro garnets, eclogitic garnets, magnesium elmonites are present in that sample. And we need to do some more drilling now to try and define exactly what it is. We colored into that material. Um, we had about three and a half meters of it in, in that drill hole, but we, we don't really have an idea of how big it could be and further drilling to delineate its extent is going to be required going forward. PK312 is a kimberlite dike about a meter and a half that we intersected. It's about several kilometers to the northwest of 311. We submitted a small sample. It was really all the material we had just to test for diamonds. It is diamond bearing. And the main reason to submit such a small sample was because of the mantle sample that we saw on the dike. It had the complete suite, abundant olivine, garnets, ilmenites, uh, and even chrome diopside macrochris, which we don't typically see a lot of being visually obvious in, in the kimberlites in this area, but they're certainly there. And uh, in our minds now, it opens up the possibility of trying to find a bigger body at the head of this train. And so clearly at PK312, we'll need to do some more work in trying to delineate the, uh, the kimberlite itself, but also looking for other larger bodies. And part of the reason we feel we'll need to do that and why it makes sense to spend some time taking a look for other bodies is, uh, is the discovery of PK314 up in the North Piku area. And it's really illustrative of the ability to find larger bodies where kimberlite dikes have, have already been discovered. PK314 um, was tested by four holes in uh, the 2015 drilling program and it was tested to a depth of over 200 meters but was discovered by taking a closer look at the existing mineral train in the North Piku area. We do have microdiamond results that are pending for 314 and, and are expected out in, in the next month or so. But just taking a look at the discovery and how it came about is, uh, as I mentioned, it's quite illustrative to the, the potential elsewhere on the property of things that could be found. This slide is a, it's a satellite image showing the North Piku indicator mineral train. The yellow line represents our interpreted extent of a series of, of kimberlite dikes that were discovered in 2013. In those drill holes, uh, intervals were in the neighborhood of from centimeter scale up to 60 or 70 centimeters, hitting up to six of those dikes in, uh, in a single drill hole. But when we looked at the extent of those dikes and, and where they sit and in relation to our indicator minerals, one of the things that just didn't sit quite right with us was the fact that we had some pyro garnets towards the central part of the train and the kimberlite dikes that we hit didn't really explain their presence in, in the tills down ice. We didn't collect a lot of samples in this area in 2014, but we did collect a few to just try and confirm the presence of these pyro garnets, and we did that. They clearly are there. There's an area of this North Piku train where we're seeing pyro garnets and, and we're not seeing them in the same abundance elsewhere. And one of the reasons we wanted to revisit this area was because the mineral chemistry that we've talked about a fair bit at Piku and the presence of these high chrome, low calcium pyro garnets, when we look at some of our highest interest garnet compositions from till samples in the properties, three of those compositions come from this, this area and from this train. And when we look geophysically at what could be there in terms of a potential source, this circle is a cutout of our airborne magnetic data. It's again, it's a calculated vertical gradient image. Uh, and you can see that trending from the eastern edge of the, of the circle, there's a pink line, which is, it's a highly magnetic a metamorphose volcanic unit, a highly magnetic amphibolite unit that we've mapped. And there's a little blip as we get towards the center part of the property. There's a little blip on the north side, and we wanted to take a closer look at that. And then you can see, actually, the collars from 2015, where we ultimately ended up drilling. Um, but when we did a more detailed ground magnetic survey over this area, just to the north of the amphibolite, we identified uh, a more subtle, discrete magnetic feature, and we drilled that, and that turned out to be the 314 kimberlite. It uh, has a width of about 25 meters, and in, in our earlier news releases, we mentioned that we really don't have a handle on strike length, but it's at least 40 meters long and probably longer than that, and we've drilled it to a significant depth of uh, well over 200 meters. And we think there can be other targets like this with some more detailed uh, magnetic surveys in particular. We think we can start to pull out subtle features that represent a, a larger and new kimberlite bodies. When we combine our experience up here in North Piku with what, uh, what we drilled at PK150 and remembering that, that that easternmost drill hole there is, is uh, only very weakly magnetic, there's the real possibility with some, some real sort of diligent, careful work and interpretation of our data sets that we can come up with a number of, of additional highly prospective targets. And so that's what, as, as we start to plan what we want to do next and we start thinking in, in more of a forward manner here, a detailed uh, heli born magnetic survey is the main thing that we're looking to get underway here in the, ne in the next month. It will cover the key target areas that we've identified at the heads of these well-defined indicator mineral trains. And from that, 
we should develop a number of targets that we will then be able to drill as part of a winter-spring 2016 drilling program. And in, in addition to drilling those new targets, we would also work to fully define the known kimberlites so that we're not leaving the field with questions about how big the bodies are, get answers on how big they are, because clearly... When we look at Piku as a whole right now, we know that there's diamond-bearing kimberlites. They're significantly diamond-bearing. We know the chemistry. We've been talking a lot about that as being chemistry is very good. And, and then there's a good mantle sample in these kimberlites. So now we need to get some tonnage. And that's what the focus will be on in 2016 is expanding the known kimberlites to their to full size and getting an idea of how big they are and finding finding new kimberlites and, and building that tonnage on the, of the kimberlites on the, on the property. Um, in the nearer term, we do have microdime results from PK314 still to come, and we're also uh, flying a fixed-wing magnetic survey over our Piku East option claims, uh, properties that tie on to the east side of the uh, Piku property, and their mineral claims that the PQ joint venture has an option to earn an interest on. Uh, and all of that work, of course, is just leading us towards this, uh, this upcoming drilling program in, in 2016. So we look forward to keeping you informed of that and our results as they come in. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the presentation. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact either myself or Nick Thomas, and we'll try and fill in any gaps that we've left. Thank you.